right, good morning, everybody. This should be a very engaging workshop. In fact, all of our workshops are engaging, but again, we're gonna have a um, great time and I see people are still um, continuing to pile in. And I'm going to introduce my former colleague, Kathleen. And Kathleen Comas, CFA, served New York Public Library, Business Library as a financial resource specialist since 2002. She created and taught financial literacy training programs for the public and staff. Previously, she was an investment vice president at New York Life Insurance Company, working as a securities analyst slash portfolio manager. Ms. Comas holds an MBA from NYU University, and she's a chartered financial analyst. Without further ado, I'd like to just introduce or reintroduce Kathleen Combs. <laughs> thank you very much, Anthony. And thank you, Erin, and uh, the rest of the LASA team for allowing me to do this presentation. That should be very, it should be very interesting. I hope you all enjoy it. The title, of course, is Successful Retirement, and that's what we all aim to have, I think. And the keys to a successful retirement are planning, and saving. They're not that hard, but in order to get them in the right order and to do the best with that, I'd like to talk about the magic of compounding, because this is really one of the most important concepts that you're going to deal with in all of your life. So let me ask you, would you rather have $10,000 a day for 30 days or a penny that doubled in value every day for 30 days? Now, I'm not gonna spend much time waiting for you to answer that question, because I'm going to give you the answer. And I hope you all got the penny, uh, which doubled in value every day for 30 days equals, I think you can see this, although I'm not sure, $5,368,709.12. And that's because compounding the interest rate on this example is 100%. So if you keep getting 100% on your money every day, it grows very quickly. I'm not going to show you how that works. You can do it for yourself, but it does work. The second concept that you really need to understand is how much that compounding helps you for your retirement. So we have an example here of two people, Amber, who began saving, she got her first job at age 22, and she saved $22 a year, every year, for 15 years until she was age 37. And she had that money in an account that compounded her savings at a 5% rate, a 5% annual rate. So you see the first year she has 31,150 after the year's interest. The next year that grows because she put in the $3,000, but you also get interest on the interest. So she now has 600, 6,458 and on and on. So ultimately over the, her lifetime, Amber saved $45,000. On the other hand, we have Connie, who didn't save any money until she turned 31. And then she saved money for 30 years, $3,000 a year. She saved a total of $90,000. However, at the end of the day, who had more money? Connie had $372,000 in her account and Amber had $372,000, whereas Connie only had $345,000. It's that early compounding, that starting early, even if it's a small amount, that helps you. So let's make some assumptions about your retirement. Now, some of these assumptions may be wrong. Are all you going to live to age 85? I really don't know. <laughs> but we're going to assume that everyone needs $50,000 a year from age 67, which is your full retirement age, according to Social Security, to age 85. And we're going to assume that you can receive, with a combination of investments, a 6% average return on investment from the present through 80, age 85. And we're going to presume a 3.1% average inflation rate from the present through age 85. Now, you all know that that's a low rate right now, and it was a high rate last year. So don't, don't question the inflation. We're trying to average it out over time just to show you what you might need. So if you're 25 years old now, it would be a good idea if you'd already saved $25,000. If you're 45 years old, 130,000. 45 years if married, 
50,000. And that's because your work, your non-working spouse would receive social security um, based on your salary. Uh, 66 years, 400,000 and 300,000 if married. Okay. So, and you can find uh, this kind of information and put in some of those estimates or your own estimates using this um, ASEC.org tools, which uh, when I did this, they're currently under construction, unfortunately. However, FINRA.org, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, also allows you to do this same. It's a little bit more complicated with FINRA, a little bit more sophisticated, but they also, if you go to tools.finra.org retirement calculator, they'll give you a calculator so you can work this out for yourself as well. So where are you going to get the money? How am I going to do this? Well, plan, <laughs> really plan. Think about some of these things right from the start. So where might your income come from? Well, you're all working, so you will most likely be receiving some Social Security income. Some of you will have pension plans. The New York Public Library, of course, has a New York State pension plan. And others of you may have different pension plans coming from different things. And you might have 401ks or 403bs. You might also be doing savings and investments on your own, which might include um, individual retirement accounts, either Roths or traditional IRAs. Um, and you could have other sources. You could get lucky. Some, you could inherit some money. One never knows. Um, this site, uh, www.mymoney.gov, uh, will give you some ideas on other ways to save money. But for retirement, well, how much money are you going to get from Social Security? Well, the average benefit in 2022 was 1657 per month, which is roughly $20,000 a year. The maximum benefit was $3,345 per month, which is roughly $40,000 a year. Doesn't meet that $50,000 goal, no, even if you were getting the maximum. And believe me, it is not easy to be getting the maximum. Uh, you would need to have earned the the maximum contribution required from the Social Security Administration every year for at least 35 years. That's not that easy. Most of us start with a little lower salary. So, however, you can find out exactly what you will be getting from the Social Security Administration, or at least get a good estimate of it, depending on how young you are, uh, by going online to the socialsecurity.gov estimator. It's very easy to use. It will provide you with estimates of your monthly benefits based on your income to date. Um, you can tell them what your income is, or you can set, uh, set up a My Security or My Social Security account, and then you'll get more exacting information. It allows you to estimate your future income and view potential benefit payments. So that's one thing that you can find out. Now, ret other retirement accounts. There are many employer-sponsored retirement accounts. The first that I'll talk about is a defined benefit plan. And that would suggest that when you started with this company or nonprofit organization or police department, whatever, um, that you were promised a benefit based on a formula using your employment years, your age, years worked, and salary, okay? You're shown the formula and all you have to do is go to work and maybe they require a contribution from you, um, maybe not, but all you have to do is work the number of years necessary, et cetera, et cetera, follow the directions and they will pay you a monthly benefit, most likely for life. Again, this is an agreement you make when you are hired. The plan, who does the investing, who worries about how the assets are growing, that's the company's problem. They've promised you this payment that's based on your age, not their, not their profits, it's based on you. And however, if the company should run into trouble and not necessarily be able to pay you these benefits, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corp guarantees some amount of benefit. So that's a defined benefit plan. Now, defined benefit plans are not as um, hmm, everyday as they once were because a couple of 
companies went bankrupt because of the defined benefit plan. They could no longer stay in business because they had such a great liability to their former employees. Consequently, many corporations now have something known as a defined contribution plan. And again, when you first are employed by the company, they will tell you about this. And there is no requirement in general that the employer make any contribution. And the employer's contribution may be a profit sharing plan. Now, what that means, if there's no profits, there's no payment. <laughs> or there may be stock options. Okay, So if it's a public company, you may, if you continue to work for them, receive stock options, which could be great if it happens to be Apple or you know, Facebook. Those, those names turned out wonderfully well if you had stock options. But what happens if that's all you have and something bad happens with the stock like Netflix? All of a sudden, your retirement plan has dropped by 60%. That's not so good. So there's some problems with that. Sometimes the employee contributes to establish the account, okay? You can't, they won't share their profits unless you show that you have that kind of interest in the company. And the other issue with the employee, this kind of defined contribution plan is generally the employer, the employee, excuse me, you are responsible for managing the account. Now, probably the company establishes a, a setup of possible investments that you can make with this. Maybe they have Vanguard helping you or TAIA helping you or some other large investment company helping you out with your management, but you still have to make the choices of what you're invested in. And the benefits are going to depend on the contribution of the employer and the employee and the performance of the investments in the account over the time, over time. Other retirement accounts that may have current tax benefits. So your employer may offer a 401k plan or a Roth 401k plan, and that would be a for-profit company like an IBM. Or if it's a not-for-profit, it might be a 403b. And that's the, the 401k, 403, those are just the numbers of the plans in the tax code. Okay, so they, they don't have any real meaning to you or me. They just are numbers and the name of the plan and not for profit organization like the New York Public Library. They have 403B plans as opposed to 401K plans. So why am I saying they may have current tax benefits? Well, if you contribute to a 401K plan and if you're making $50,000, um, and you contribute $10,000 to a 401k plan, your current income taxes will be based on a $40,000 salary, okay? So that means they will be taking fewer taxes out now, okay? So your salary will be a little bit higher now, but you will be investing that money in a 401k. And in the end, when you take that money out, you will be taxed on. Now, if it's a Roth 401k, and this is a fairly new addition to, to the uh, possibilities of things, then you will pay taxes on your current income. But when you take the money out later, you will not. Okay, we'll get into more of that later. The same rules apply for the 403bs. Now, the amounts you can contribute as of 2022, this is a list of that. If you're under 50 years of, yes, under 50 years of age in 2022, you can contribute a maximum of $20,500 to your 401k. And if you are over 50 years of age, you have a catch-up contribution concept that started after the 2009 well, recession, I guess we'll call it. Okay, so if you're over 50, you can contribute as much as $27,000 into your 401k. If you can put that much money in, it's fantastic. If you can put in $5,000, $2,000, it's great. Any money you put in, remember, Amber only, only put in money in the early years of her life. It's the compounding you want. 
Okay. So again, there are other retirement plans that may be offered if you only work for yourself. If you're in a self-employed, you could start a SEP IRA, or if some very small companies also offer the SEP IRAs. It's a simplified employee pension plan. And there, the contribution limits are a little bit greater. The limit is the smaller of $61,000 or 25% of your total compensation. With a Roth 401k or 403b, the contributions, again, it's 20,000 plus the 6,500, which is the same as you have on, on, on the previous page. And the employer contribution limits, if you add the two together, is 100% of the employee's compensation or 61,000 in 2022. And over 50, you can add an additional 65,000 to that. Now, the government changes these numbers virtually every year. So I have to warn you that don't come back and look at my PowerPoint five years from now and expect the numbers to be right. They won't be. These kinds of retirement plans are used by small companies and often one person. If you're a, um, a freelance person of one sort or another, this is the kind of IRA you can set up for yourself. Now, the other thing I need to talk about with retirement accounts, which may have current tax benefits, is they are all different, okay? Each employer, the rules for the employer-sponsored accounts are very broad. And consequently, different companies offer different plans to their employees. No, you know, virtually no two plans are the same. And it may seem like, okay, oh, I have a, um, a, a retire a 401k plan with Vanguard. And my friend here has a retirement plan with Vanguard. And you'll find out they're both entirely different. Okay. Why, which, how, what you can contribute, when the company will make contributions, when you can borrow money from it, all of that may be different. Some are way more generous than others. Some employers may match contributions. Some may offer loans based on your balance. Others may not. Okay. So it's up to you to understand what the retirement plans your com company is offering are. Second thing you need to know about 401ks and 403dbs is some plans may allow hardship distributions. Now, not all plans have to offer the exact same kinds of distribution. Excuse me. Some do, some don't. But there are possibilities of taking some money out of your 401k or 403b. And some of this is quite new. And so there may have been changes in your 401k 403B plan in the past year or two, reflecting changes in the laws and what the IRS is allowing. A lot of it changed because of the pandemic. Medical care expenses for the employee, the employee spouse, dependents, or other beneficiaries, you might be able to make a withdrawal. Costs related to the purchase of an employee's principal residence, excluding mortgage payments, might be able to make a withdrawal. Tuition related, education fees, room and board expenses for the next 12 months of post-secondary education for the employee or the employee's spouse or children, maybe, okay? Payments necessary to prevent eviction, maybe. Funeral expenses for the employee, maybe. Certain expenses to re repair damages to the principal residence. Uh, because of the hurricanes that we had that destroyed so many people's homes. So this is a much more lenient than it was 10 years ago, way more lenient. There used to be no excuses, no withdrawals, no excuses, <laughs> not anymore. Okay, so retirement accounts, which still may have current tax benefits. You can have a self-directed traditional IRA or a self-directed Roth IRA. Okay, these are different. This is outside of any company that you're working for, something that you can set up. These are individual retirement accounts. And a traditional individual retirement account may have current tax benefits, the same as the 401ks. However, anyone can open 
one of these accounts as long as they have earned income. Earned income is salary, wages, and tips. It is not interest income. It is not social security income. It's not unemployment income, okay? You can contribute up to $6,000 per year or your taxable compensation, okay? So if you only earn $3,000 a year, but you have a savings account that has some money in it, you can make a contribution to your IRA, okay? Even if you had to live on the $3,000 that you made. If you are over 50 years of age, you can contribute, that, again, this that catch-up rule, you can contribute up to $7,000 per year or your taxable compensation. It is possible that these contributions are tax deductible, depending on your income and other retirement plans. So if you have a defined benefit pension plan and you want to contribute to a, a traditional IRA, you certainly can but it is not going to be a tax deductible contribution, okay? I have to understand that. There are tax penalties for withdrawals prior to age 59 and a half with some exceptions, okay? And with a traditional IRA, mandatory withdrawals start at age 72. These are known as RMDs, and it is mandatory that you start taking money out at age 72. And when you start taking money out, those funds are fully taxable. Okay, so then a Roth IRA. Contributions, again, of $6,000 of earned income, $7,000 for those over 50, can be made. Provide, now, again, it's earned income, okay? Provided your income does not exceed stated levels, okay? Contributions are not tax deductible, okay? Anything that has Roth in front of it, the contributions are not tax deductible going in. But your earnings are tax-free and remain tax-free on distribution. So you put the money in when you're 25, and when you take it out after age 59 and a half, and it's grown seven times over, there's no tax on any of that, not on the money you put in and not on the money that the investments gained, okay? However, with Roth IRAs, money cannot be withdrawn for five years after the initial contribution, okay? Doesn't matter what the initial contribution was. If the initial contribution was $1,000 or maybe even $500, that's still your starting line. Doesn't matter how what a small amount it was, and how much you have in there. You can't withdraw for the first five years, but you can withdraw after that. Tax penalties for withdrawals before age 59 and a half, with some exceptions, particularly the $10,000 for a first-time home buyer. That is the only exception that predates all the changes. That was there 10 years ago for first-time home buyers to encourage this. Some other restrictions apply. Some of it is income related. If you're earning too much money, it, the, things, things can change with both the traditional IRAs and the Roth IRAs. Required minimum withdrawals. Okay, traditional 401ks, when you reach age 72 or later, if you continue to work. So if you continue to work beyond age 72, for however long you continue to do that, you do not have to withdraw from your 401k, from your traditional 401k. Once you stop working, all, you must take an RMD out of this, and all your distributions at that point are taxable. For Roth 401ks, when you reach age 72 or when you retire, However, for Roth, anything that has to do with Roth, the distributions are not taxable because you paid the taxes on your original income. Traditional IRAs, when you reach age 72, you must start taking, the distributions are required and they are taxable. And with Roth IRAs, the distributions are not required. 
Okay. And you don't need to pay taxes on them. If you do take a distribution, you don't pay any tax on the distribution from a Roth IRA. Some inheritance tax rules. This gets very complicated and we won't spend much time on it. But spousal beneficiaries of an IRA have the option of taking the account over and managing it as if it were their own, which would include the calculation of required minimum with distributions. If you have a non-spousal beneficiary, that person has to withdraw all the money from the account within 10 years of the death of the original account holder. That is a very new regulation, okay? Used to be even non-spousal beneficiaries just received required minimum uh, distributions based on their age. Now you have to take the money out within 10 years of the death of the original account holder. 401ks, again, spousal beneficiaries can roll the money into an inherited IRA and take RMDs based on their age and, and the name beneficiaries. Non-spousal beneficiaries can also roll the money into an inherited IRA and take RMDs based on their age. Okay, so retirement accounts. How, where to open an IRA? It's easy to open an IRA. It's just a form, okay? Any bank, Citibank, Chase, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, you name it. Any bank will walk in and say you want to open an IRA. They'll sit you down. It's a form. All you need to do is fill out this form that gives you your, your name, your social security number, your address, who are the beneficiaries, et cetera, et cetera. All the mutual funds, Fidelity, Vanguard, Franklin Templeton, all, you know, all of them, the brokerage houses, Merrill Lynch, Ameritrade, Schwab, you name it, they all do it. No questions. However, all that is is filling out a form and putting a little money in. The problem is it doesn't compound if all you do is put a little money in. You need to put a little money in and then invest those monies. And the difference with an IRA account versus those 401 accounts is now you actually have to do the investing and you have to start from scratch. In any of those retirement plans, the 401ks from a company or even a SEP IRA, there will be a plan administer, administrator like a Vanguard, like a Fidelity, like a JP Morgan, like a whoever, or TIAA. All of those people administer these plans and will give you a set of investment possibilities, mostly mutual funds, in fact, all mutual funds, but mostly mutual funds. And you need to make choices of those mutual funds. With an IRA account, you can invest any way you like. You can invest in individual stocks, bonds, mutual funds, REITs, all sorts of things like that. You can choose very conservative instruments. You can leave it in a money market account, um, but you can choose to put it in certificates of deposits. And you can even do some really very, very speculative things. I dared to mention gold coins, but that's somewhat restricted. But Fidelity now is going to allow some of these plans to invest in cryptocurrency. So it's wide open for you with an IRA account. However, this flexibility means you need to make the decisions. Okay, it's not just choosing. You need to make your own decisions. Now, of course, whoever you've opened it with will be willing to talk to you. <laughs> no doubt they'll be willing to talk to you as you uh, set up your investments. But you have to choose the investments you will be most comfortable with and which ones are best suited to help your goals. So just a quick look at what reward is versus risk. You can see treasury bills, that's the risk-free rate, whatever it's at. With a bank CD, there's a very minimal more amount of risk. Uh, Long-term bonds, more risk. Large company stock, small company stock, more risk. And these are just possible possibilities, comparative returns that you may find. And when you're looking at a list of mutual funds, be it from Vanguard, be it from Fidelity, be it from whomever you're working with, they'll all have a certain amount of explanations of what you're investing in. Each mutual fund has to state its objectives and you need to look at them, understand them. You need to read a certain amount about what you're investing in, understand them, 
and make sure their objectives meet your goals and that you understand how much risk you're taking and how much reward you can expect to get. Okay, so with that, live long and prosper. <laughs>